Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us for this live streamed interview. Uh, my name is Nicholas Lear, and I am the managing editor of the Oxford Political Review. And I'm delighted today to be joined by David Hennig. David is one of the UK's foremost trade experts and a former trade negotiator himself. Uh, he is the co founder of the UK Trade Forum and the director of trade policy at the European Centre for International Political Economy. In that capacity, he works with politicians, industry representatives, and NGOs advising on the UK's independent trading policy. David has also served in the UK government civil service as an assistant director at both the Department of International Trade and the Department of Business, Innovation and Skills. For three years, he supported the government's uh, work on the proposed transatlantic trade and investment partnership between the EU and the United States. Uh, David and I will be discussing uh, the EU, uh, UK EU trade and cooperation agreement, uh, how we got here, the details of that agreement, uh, and also what it means for the future of the UK. David, thank you very much indeed for joining me this morning. Thank you. Thank you for the invite. I shall do my best now to uh, answer your questions. Nothing I say should be taken as legal advice, etc. <laughs> Usual disclaimers apply. <laughs> well, listen, uh, we'll start off. Um, it's obviously, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's in the news right now. Uh, I was watching Parliament just before coming on to this interview. Uh, the, the, the agreement is being scrutinised as we speak. Um, and this trade deal was agreed on Christmas Eve, um, just one week before the end of the transition period. Uh, it's a pretty hefty document, uh, as you say. It's it's you know it's 1,246 pages, I believe, including annexes. Uh, having read and analysed it somewhat, uh, what is your headline assessment? Are there winners and losers, or is this a fair compromise? I think the first thing to say about it is this is a free trade agreement. It is uh, squarely in the in the space of uh, of free trade agreements. I don't know what people were expecting. It sounds like some people in the Labour Party were expecting rather more, they're expecting, I don't know, somewhere close to EFTA or seamless trade. It isn't that. A free trade agreement does not give you that. It merely improves things compared to WTO terms, World Trade Organization terms. So in that in that space, are there winners and losers be, with, within that? Well, both sides wanted the continuation of tariff-free trade. Both sides have got the continuation of tariff-free trade. Um, there are these extra parts to it, like fish. Now, fish was supposed to be a big, uh, a big UK uh, card and something we weren't going to give away. Well, I don't think, I don't think we did win on fish, and I don't think we won on uh, level playing field. But on the other hand, the UK doesn't have to follow anything to do with the ECJ except for one reference in an, um, with regard to EU programmes. So both sides have compromised. But I would argue that the UK has probably compromised more compared to what has been said over the last few months than the EU. Mm -hmm. Well, let's start off with how we got to this point. Um, you know a fair about, about negotiating trade agreements, and, and this year has had its fair share of challenges. Um, how much credit do the negotiating teams deserve for, for getting this done in nine months amid a pandemic? That, I think, is the, the place where they should be given the most credit. Um, there were a lot of doubters, myself probably included, that said, you know, can you really get a trade deal done in nine months? This has hardly ever been done in such timing before. You are trying to do not just trade, you are also doing haulage, aviation, fishing and so on. Then there was a, a, a pandemic and still they have managed to complete in nine months. So that's quite impressive. Now, there were some corners cut in doing so. One of the reasons why it's fully tariff and quota free is there wasn't time to haggle about particular sensitive lines. And that was another reason why the level playing field became so important. And there's also a few areas that are not included because time was too tight or that was more helpful pol politically. So you set the deadline, you've achieved it, but you do get some trade offs. And it's the story of trade deals. There are always trade offs and the trade off for doing this quickly was arguably that the UK got a slightly worse result. But on the other hand, we got it over with. So again, winners and losers. Well, both sides got a little bit of what they wanted. Mm. But do you think this uh, this would have happened but for the UK government's willingness to pursue a no deal? I don't think the, the no deal makes, uh, makes a huge amount of difference. Mm. If, if I'm honest, the EU strategy, um, you know, they, they pin down what their 
red lines were they didn't change yeah. them they said the deal deal or no deal these are these are our red lines you have to meet them in yeah. the end the you know the uk was forced to actually make the choice did it really mean no no deal or not and decided that they that they didn't but i don't think it actually made a huge amount of difference to the way the eu negotiated once the once the EU have decided here's where we stand, do the deal on this basis or don't do the deal, that actually we think you're going to come back and we, on balance, we don't think you're serious and that they turn out to be right, mm. then I don't think the threats to, to walk away actually add a, anything to it. And if we look, particularly in the last few weeks, the issues where the UK didn't get that great a deal, fish level playing field, you would expect a better deal if your threats to walk away had been serious, and if the other side really cared about that. So somewhere along the line, those threats, yeah, they, they didn't seem to make much difference to the results. Mm. Let, let's turn the clock back a little bit to the start of uh, this process, which began some four and a half years ago. Um, after the referendum, Donald Tusk, then president of the European Council, said that the UK won't be allowed an a la carte option uh, within the European single market. And, of course, not much later, uh, Theresa May imposed her own red lines. You mentioned the EU's red lines there. Um, she was notorious for imposing those red lines. Um, is the landing zone of this agreement anywhere near where you expected it would be based on how this process started out? Yes, I think that based on this is this is the landing zone that Theresa May set with her with her speech. Once she has ruled out the single market because of immigration, and ruled out in effect the the customs union you're then in a haggle all right her proposed um proposals would have ha would have been slightly more fully formed there would have been a um, more sharing of regulation in return for for fewer checks but ultimately you are in the same sort of ballpark as we are now which is that there are not going to be uh tariffs and quotas there is going to be some regulatory alignment we're going to discuss and haggle over how much that is and that has some impact on the the market access you get but i, I can remember um an, an event um that uh, i was part of the organization for the uk trade forum back i think it was in early 2018 on the what where the uk and eu would end up and both of the main the main speakers there said the uk and eu will end up with a free with a free trade agreement that mm -hmm. looks a bit like this um you know that yes there was uh, there's always the chance that at the margins you would have uh, some slightly different choices made but theresa may sets sets this process in train and it's taken us oh how long is it since lancaster's yeah four four and a bit years to get mm -hmm. from there to its logical uh, conclusion mm -hmm. yeah and uh, i mean another key pro part of this process um was the shift uh, from Theresa May's position on the Northern Irish uh, backstop, and of course, um, you know uh, that was the issue that I think ultimately brought down uh, her administration. And um, Boris Johnson replaced that with the imposition of a regulatory border uh, down the Irish Sea. Um, in terms of the differences, what what are the fundamental differences between what Theresa May was proposing in, in practice and what Johnson agreed, and, and how will this regulatory border work? Fundamentally, it was a the the UK had to choose between uh, either Northern Ireland following EU goods regulations or the whole of the UK following yeah. EU goods regulations. And the UK government said, "Sorry, Northern Ireland, you're you know you're gonna you're gonna have to uh, be on your own here." Um, mm -hmm. That was fundamentally the choice. And you can put it even more crudely: was it it was the it was the union versus a harder versus a harder brexit and the harder brexit was chosen over the union now the impact the implications of that um i think are still to be to be played through i think you know that has to go down as one of the most significant choices made by a uk government in 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 modern times i think that you know we could be looking back on that choice in 20 years time and you know yeah. and answering essay questions along the lines of uh, was was it inevitable that northern ireland and scotland would leave the uk once the uk chose a hard brexit yeah. over uh over over the union that it seemed to me was it was a huge moment but that is clearly what happened and it's been slightly obfuscated in that uh, boris johnson way he's covered it up he said there weren't going to be checks then quietly a couple of weeks before christmas the checks were agreed with exemptions because modern trade you do have lots of exemptions but the check the checks are in place and yeah great britain to northern ireland uh, 
is 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 treated in a different way to any other into UK uh, trade. Mm. Of course, um, Theresa May couldn't sell her deal to Parliament. Uh, I wanted to just ask, you know, do you think that the EU bears any responsibility for uh, the failure to agree a deal with with her administration that that she could sell to the UK Parliament, or, or was it just inevitable that that the the sort of political sands would shift towards a, a harder Brexit? No, I think it depends on the individuals involved. In my opinion, I, I think that uh, I, th I think that again, we 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 look back on the whole process over five years, and right now it look it look, it seems to me that Boris Johnson is the crucial figure all the way along. He mm. has been the person who has set the UK's course over the last five years. And if he if he had said I can live with Theresa May's deal, she could have probably got it through. Mm. He didn't. He you know presumably for his, his his own purposes he 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 then said but i'll i'll leave northern i'll lose northern ireland again whereas previously that would have been controversial now you know not about not a vote against it in the in the uh, in the conservative party so it's, it seems it seems to me that it's not the eu that is central to the point of what uh the conservative party will accept on in terms of the eu it is purely down to uh to, to, to boris johnson and his ability to read the uh, the Conservative Party, and I think we underestimate that. I think that the the people who are not fans of Johnson, and let's face it, there's a lot of them, underestimate his mastery of the the day to day politics in the uh, in the Conservative Party, and we really should know better now after really five five years. Mm. Before we turn to the details of the agreement, I just want to ask um, how this, as you, said, as you mentioned at the start, this free trade agreement compares with with others that the the EU have negotiated in in the past, for example. CETA. How does this compare? Yeah, it, it, I mean, obviously, in fundamentals, there's, there's a lot of similarities. A lot of the text is copied out. A lot of the text of trade agreements is copied out um, from agreement to agreement, which is why we've seen the uh, amusing story about Netscape Communicator 4 being referenced in there, even though uh, it hasn't been a current product since about 2000. So you, you see then how a trade deal is, is, is built up. So a lot of the text is there. But there are some crucial differences, um, several really. One, the, the level playing field. The UK didn't want to go further than Canada. Canada has a uh, commitment from both parties that they won't regress their labour and environment commitments, but it's not enforceable. They just talk about it a bit. Um, so that's completely different in this, in this deal. A second obvious difference is that Canada is not fully tariff and quota free. There are, for example, quotas to access Canada's notoriously protectionist cheese and dairy market. And there are tariffs and quotas to accept the EU's quite protectionist agriculture markets. And then the third difference, I think, is that the regulatory alignment in EU Canada is higher than the regulatory alignment in UK EU, such that Canada manages to get um, equivalence in various food regulations or uh, food safety regulations that allows it to have a lower rate of checks than the UK. Now, what this tells me for the UK and for the future is that actually that means we could probably have signed up for more and not had um, um, any any problems getting it through Parliament. Arguably, it's actually the EU who decided to use the excuse for reasons of time not to give us that to make make sure that they had more bargaining uh, chips available in the future it probably wasn't the uk who would have would have uh, wouldn't have gone further so i think i think those that those would be the areas I, I would suggest so it's ended up being canada plus a bit minus a bit um in 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 uh, in, in different areas mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, in terms of looking at the actual agreement, um, is it fair to characterise it in terms of defensive interests? So if you look at what, what you know, broadly has been agreed, it seems to me that the UK has sought to defend its sovereignty and the EU sought to preserve the internal market. Is that a fair characterisation, really, that this was about defensive interests and not so much about rights, per se, that, that the UK could, could be granted? I think that the way the agreements ended up, it has been mostly about the, the defensive interests. So, I mean, I guess if we if we look at this in terms of, of interest, first of all, from an EU point of view, the EU's main offensive interest in trade agreements is to gain um, um, recognition for its scheme of geographical indications on, on food. Now, it achieves that already in the withdrawal agreement. 
So uh, it's already achieved one of one of the, those things. And then its other major offensive interest in uh, in in this deal is the the preservation of um, uh, peace and no land border in Ireland. It's also achieved that in the withdrawal agreement. So if we then get to the um, th this this trade agreement, the, the EU is left with um, predominantly the defensive interest of protecting the single market. Then it has a broader offensive interest in terms of um spreading the eu regulatory system but that's let's say a loose um interest which it thinks is going to happen anyway regardless of what get what happens it um what the, the content is so that you know they want that but they're not really sure how to bring it about so it is mostly about mm. level playing field of protection of the single market mm. and fish of course now the uk um you know it's not clear what the uk's actual interests are and priorities and i think this is what comes out late in the day so what is the uk's real interest here is it the tariff and tariffs and uh, and, and and quotas the absence of them because nissan have said they're going to leave if you don't have that now that's a that's a pretty big uh, that's a pretty big stick nissan have just wielded there is it the purity of the uh, the sovereignty? It's certainly the absence of uh, references to the ECJ, but how pure mm. is it the, you know, that we really, because at one stage we didn't want any level playing field uh, commitments beyond Canada. Is mm. it that? It's never entirely clear. Is it fish? Is it that we really want to get more fish? Is it financial services? No, clearly not. Very early on we discover it's not financial services. In the end, the revealed preference of the UK is that the tariff and quota free comes before anything else because of Nissan and because of manufacturing in general. Um, so, but the ECJ and the ECJ is probably the other the other priority. In which case, we have to compromise heavily on fish and the and the level playing field. Um, so, you know, I think that's it's probably a slight simplification to call that defensive and offensive uh, interests, but certainly. Yeah. Both sides got their major interests. It just took a while, in the case of the UK, to learn what those were. And that's common in a negotiation, because a negotiation is not just about me, the UK, taking on you, the EU. It's about me, the UK, working out what it is with my stakeholders that they want. What are my actual hard red lines and what actually I can, uh, I can weaken on? Same with the other side. And so you're having these negotiations in the last weeks. How important really is fish to my side? How important is Nissan to my side? And in the end, Nissan beats fish. Well, you just mentioned that compromises on the level playing field. I'm interested in asking you because um, the ERG yesterday, uh, I'm sure you're aware, uh, published its uh, legal advisory committee opinion on the agreement and they concluded uh, that the agreement is sovereignty compliant. Uh, so are, are you surprised about that, given that the level playing field clauses do actually seem to go further than other trade agreements? Well, I'm not surprised that the ERG have flexibility in the way they define sovereignty. Um, I'm sure that they have said it differently in the past. Um, similarly, the Prime Minister has said it differently yeah. in the past. In fact, yeah. only a few weeks ago, the Prime Minister said that no Prime Minister could sign up for a uh, for a deal um, that, in, that where you know you could have um, tariffs being imposed if the UK failed to um, implement particular regulations. Just like previously, the Prime Minister said no Prime Minister could sign up for a uh, border in the Irish Sea. So that's a double for for Johnson because he's done precisely two things that he said no prime minister would not would sign up for, um, and so what we see I think is that sovereignty is defined in a loose and flexible way. I mean, even the ECJ is there because there's no the UK again decides that Horizon, the uh, yeah. EU research program, is more important than the ECJ, and so we'll sign up for the ECJ for Horizon only, um, and for any other programs. So. Again, it's a case of ordering what the reality is. So what, how have we decided sovereignty to be? In the end, we've decided that sovereignty is the ability to, to, to pass our laws. And if somebody takes trade sanctions against us, well, that's, that's OK, really. I mean, it's prob that's probably right. That's probably it's a move towards a more established international notion of sovereignty and away from the idea that our regulations are set in isolation. The reality of regulations is that there's a there's a global system for them and we will continue to uh follow uh, a lot of eu uh, product regulations because they are the de facto global standard setter
Mm-hmm. You wrote this you morning, wrote this morning, 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 morning in its scrutiny of this agreement needs to scrutinise uh, an agreement's policy implications in particular. Um, so what do you see this morning, given that this debate is going on, uh, as the most important policy implications arising out of this agreement? So I think they, I think that there should be a debate about the level playing field uh, commitments. I think there should be a debate about what is it that the UK government thinks it is allowed to do before um, there would be uh, tariff and trade implications with the EU. And I'm thinking particularly of climate change. Both the EU and the UK are going to have pretty active uh, uh, climate change uh, policies in, in, in the future. But is there anything that the UK does potentially that actually or not does that will leave us in in potential breach and facing sanctions so in the future we're going to have to look at, at this and say there's you know 670 billion pounds of trade a year with the eu are we likely to get sanctions if we do this piece of legislation so i think the level playing field is definitely worth looking at i think we need to look at uk manufacturing i think we need to look at the car industry in particular and say to what extent is the car industry really protected by this deal and I'm I'm not absolutely sure I know the answer there's a lot of people have been writing about electric vehicles battery production but it seems to me that we're not that well placed to maintain a car manufacturing industry with this deal there is a danger of it kind of slipping away slowly yeah. I might be wrong about that but I would like to to, to see that uh, to see that debate Similarly, on a much smaller scale, processed food and drink products, which we are very good at making and selling, are any of those particularly hit by mm-hmm. the rules of origin? You know, they're not going to be, they're not going to count, um, get preferential tariff access, or are they going to be hit by border mm-hmm. measures? You know, in the past, we've heard, for example, that uh, shellfish from Scotland. Uh, which are fre- fresh, to, um, if they get held up at the border for 24 hours, they lose half their value or something. I'm making that up slightly, but I've heard similar. Is that the case? Has that been considered? And if it hasn't been considered, can we put something in place? So it comes down to the, that level of specificity about the deal, I think. That, right? You know, What are the implications? And we never did this with the, really with the withdrawal agreement, such that the Prime Minister could still be saying there will be no checks between Great Britain and Northern Ireland when clearly had there been proper scrutiny of the withdrawal agreement, it would have demonstrated that there most definitely would be checks. So it is that sort of thing of, of thinking about the uh, the future that would be the scrutiny that you would you would want. And you would want different MPs raising the issues from their constituencies, from the businesses they talk to. And I'll take the, the, the story that was on Sky News yesterday about the man who sells glass eels. Um, which I didn't, you know, we didn't fully follow. But what is the problem with selling glass mm-hmm. eels to the uh, to the EU in the future? Mm-hmm. I saw that story. Um, um, the thing in relation to uh, his concerns about local producers in the EU being able to, uh, uh, to well, people go straight to to them because they, you know you don't need as much uh, by way of paperwork. Uh, just quickly looking at the um, rules of origin uh, issue, and um, I, I, you know. I, I'm aware that the government will be, be selling this deal today as, um, as one of the zero tariff, zero quota. Um, but clearly, it's not as simple as that. And tariffs will apply by default uh, unless there is compliance with rules of origin. Um, and this is particularly significant, as you mentioned, for the UK automotive sector. Um, and, you know, how, how do you see this um, playing out, given that you know, we, we do gather parts from around the world and, and they, they may well not qualify as, as local content to, to comply with those rules. Right. Uh, that's a big that's a big question. And there's some big there's some big issues there that I'm going I'm going to try and uh, touch on because you've got the the prevailing economic climate at the moment, which is the demand for from part populations to have more manufacturing in, the, in their uh, in their countries. Um, the belief in 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 reshoring so that's the the backdrop to this that you know and, and, and again as against global value change then you've got the change in the car industry from petrol engine to hybrids and elect and electric vehicles you've mm-hmm. got a state a huge state aid question because quite frankly all of these battery uh, production plants are being massively subsidized in ways that is 
somewhat dubious under any trade rules, whether WTO or a free free trade agreement. And then you've got the investment cycles of major manufacturers, which typically are five years plus. So which is why they they don't want to make quick decisions on this. Plus, you've got consolidation going on in the in the car industry. Now, you put all of that lot together with then the deal that we've got, and that's bound to have an effect on what we have probably already seen is a disinvestment going on in the in the UK. And we're probably behind the curve in terms of a battery factory, although we've just that one was announced in the northeast of uh, of England, but not it's not entirely clear who it's going to supply. And so what would you say? You would say that you really want to know the answer to this. Are we well, we don't seem obviously to be well placed to be a future manufacturer of cars, if that really matters to us. Um, now, what would we have to do to become one with this deal? The deal doesn't mean you cannot um, do do that because you've got the you know you you've got the potential for zero tariffs. You're not in fact going to diverge from your regu regulations from the uh, the EU. However, whatever you say, car regulations, you're going to stick pretty close to the uh, to the EU. So we've got the potential, but are we willing to put the effort into making this happen? Right now, the last four years has been poor for this as well. We've had the disinvestment because business hasn't been able to get good answers from the government about the stability of the UK's trading relations. Are we prepared to now try to make up for that and really attract the car industry here or to, to keep it here? Very unclear to me. But anyway, yeah, that, that long answer just demonstrates to me just demonstrate there's a there's a really big issue in, mm. with the with the UK car industry and with keeping the UK car industry. And I think that you would want um, you would want the government to be saying we are committed to uh, to this and we're going to take all the steps we can, as many steps they're taking in other countries. And you would want the the Labour Party to be pushing for that to be to be held to them to be held to account i'm not quite sure that's happening on either uh, score mm -hmm. before we came before on, we came on you know, we were speaking about um, um uh, uh, the questions that lawyers i think one in particular is on this so-called rebalancing mechanism uh which is i believe a novel feature of, of of the agreement and just just in particular there's a section that sets out that where there are significant divergences across the level playing field uh, that, quote, materially impact uh, bilateral trade and investment, that these rebalancing measures, uh, I suppose like tariffs, ca can be used. Um, I want to ask you, how, how might the UK government, or indeed the EU, uh, act in a way that triggers uh, these articles? And, and is, it, is it really like that likely? No. Mm. Um, so <laughs> the Go experience... Off of these of i mean even of previous um uh, level playing field clause and trade agreements which are a lot weaker is yeah. that the purpose of them being there is to is to prevent action being taken before it's taken if you like to prevent breaches um mm -hmm. dispute settlements in trade agreements are virtually never used in fact apart from the w wto why is that well the trade agreement is a loose framework it's not a detailed manual and both sides will be, you know, um, um, easy, easing their way around around that detail and implementing it as best they can. Now, within that, you don't really want to get to a situation where you are challenging each other on the absolute every every dot of, a, of an I, every cross T going into clause by clause. You know, it's just there as a, as a, as a framework uh, for a trading relationship. So, you know, when we get to the rebalancing mechanism, what the EU will be hoping is that by, you know, every, every so often, if the UK threatens to do something like, I don't know, um, have more action against trade unions in the UK, that the EU will call in the, the ambassador or the whatever the policy lead is and say, yeah, you know, we, we, we might want to raise a case on this if you uh, if you keep going. Um, and the UK might say, no, no, we're not going to do that. And then the EU might go along and say, Yes, well, you know, we've just been negotiating this current uh, set of new set of equivalents or easing of uh, easing of checks that might be in terrible trouble if you were to push this legislation mm -hmm. through and just gradually. And, you know, at the end of that, just to give all those threats teeth, 
we'll we'll use the rebalancing mechanism if all of that fa if all of that fails. But the usual experience is that all of that will not fail. That um, it will all be done behind the scenes through uh, through 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 diplomacy. The the clauses, the rebalancing clause, is there to make the earlier threats credible. Uh, that the that the EU will take action, and that's what the EU want to do. They never actually. I mean, the EU has actually been historically behind the curve on these kind of enforcement clauses. The the US has enforced uh, has had enforceable uh, level playing field clauses since two thousand and eight. So the the EU is twelve years behind. They've been a bit reluctant to do this, um, but they've never been reluctant to throw their weight around. And ultimately, that's that's what these clauses are. Are, are, are there for it so it's a threat but it's in the anticipation of hope is going to be this is all this is all sorted out nicely uh, behind the scenes mm. there's a lot of detail we could discuss uh, before we move to the future of uh, uk trade but i just want to touch on one aspect of this agreement and that that relates to financial services um obviously services are essential to the uk economy 80 percent, i believe uh, of the uk economy um and as you said at the start really not a lot has been said in, in the room about financial services. I think there were declarations published on, on Boxing Day um, that, that, that the EU would like to reach an agreement with the UK uh, via a memorandum of understanding by March as to um, recognition of each other's rules. That's, that's at least perhaps the intention. But um, why do you think that you know, financial services were put on the back burner, uh, so to say, and, and how do you expect later negotiations to run um, regarding them? Well, there's a story on financial services going back to 2016, which kind of involves the uh, the City of London with the tacit approval of the uh, the government, trying to mm -hmm. make the case that we are so special in the UK, you need us so much in the EU that you will do a very special deal for us, and um, that is in your interest, the EU. And the EU didn't take terribly kindly to being uh, talk talked to in that way, and said, no, no, we won't uh, get stuffed, basically. Um, more or less along those lines. So it wasn't played very well uh, uh, early on um, against that backdrop. And in public, the UK government has never particularly wanted to say that, you know, bankers should be prioritised ahead of uh, people who work on, uh, on, on fishing boats, um, even though probably in the end they have been. Um, so, but also services are never terribly well covered in a trade agreement anyway. There's a general assumption that services should be able to be provided cross-border. And then a list of exemptions lasting hundreds of pages as to which rules are in place to ensure that's not the case. Mm -hmm. In financial services, you have the equivalence framework, which is always supposed to be separate and which the EU has, um, uh, I think we've used this phrase before, weaponized to, <laughs> to say, well, we're just going to take our time on this equivalence to make sure you behave yourself. Um, mm -hmm. And also just to encourage a little bit more movement of um, um of, of London uh, based activity into uh, into the EU. Ultimately, though, the EU knows that London is an offshore financial risk for it. So it does want uh, some kind of cooperation and equivalence. And I think quite cleverly has managed to take that out of the main negotiations yeah. and into and into uh, and into a separate one. And this is this is kind of what the EU does. So again, going back to the earlier scrutiny question, what should also should the UK be asking? Yeah. Look, how do we cope with an EU? That is a big, strong, powerful actor that has tactics for things like financial services in terms of, you know, we, we want to get the upper hand and we want what we want. How do you get what the UK wants? We've not really worked that out yet. I'm told from people in uh, Norway and Ukraine, the best way to do it is to sign agreements and then work out where the grey areas are later and just sort of exploit them. Sounds yeah, like a, yeah. potentially a good a good plan to me. But. You know, we need we need to uh, to work that out. So the plan for financial services is there should be a memorandum of understanding signed by March, some cooperation, probably some equi some equivalence measures there. Um, but well, on the one hand, you know, there are going to be more barriers for doing business from London. There is going to be a threat. Some I've heard quite a lot of talk of um, U.S. Uh, providers in particular thinking we could provide for the EU from New York. Why do we need London? Yeah. On the other hand, London, we're very good at services. Even despite the barriers, we're probably still going to be very good at, ser at services. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's such a thing, you know, you can set up subsidiaries, you can do various things. So I sometimes wonder whether all of this is actually going to make that much difference or whether the UK is actually strong enough in services that 
even though there are extra barriers, we'll still be we'll be able to overcome them more easily. So I'm probably more optimistic about financial services than I am about car manufacturing, just because I think our competitive advantage in financial services is much higher than it is in car manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Let's turn now to turn the future of uh, UK, 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 UK work that you are doing, doing with, uh, with uh, the ECIC. Um, many will think now that this is it with with Brexit. That somehow we've uh, we've come to the end of the process and uh, uh, and we can move on with our lives. But uh, of course, um, other non-EU states like Switzerland uh, are in continual renegotiation with the EU. We, we see that uh, even this year. Uh, the TCA itself provides for, I believe, annual renegotiations. Um, so what do you expect going forward? We've just talked about financial services that, you know, might come uh, in March, a memorandum of understanding. But what do you expect the key issues to be looking into the foreseeable future as these annual negotiations take place? Well, it depends really whether the UK is going to develop an industrial strategy at some point or mm. going to want to implement one and have priorities. At the moment, we don't really have priorities, whether between car manufacturing, financial services, pharmaceuticals, whatever it is. Now, if you have priorities in those areas, you are going to have extra things you are going to want to achieve year on year with the EU as the, la the nearest large market to that. Because you can sign trade deals with Australia and New Zealand, but there are you know, you're going to have your work cut out to be making pharmaceuticals to sell to Australia. It's possible, but there are people who are going to be making them closer to Australia than you are, for example, in India. So, you know, EU is the nearest big market. Right. So we want to be a player in, I don't know, car manufacturing, pharmaceuticals. We want to sell to the EU. What have we got? Well, we need to have more mutual recognition or we need to have more equivalents or we want the EU to accept this particular uh, regulation. We want the EU not to pass a certain regulation that might stop us. And there's going to be a constant stream of this stuff happening because the world of regulation never stops. There's always new regulations on, on everything. So then the, the trade agreement has to keep up with that and to say, here's what the UK needs in the, in this area. Um, you know, can we can we can we deliver that in the agreement? And yes, other agreements come in yes you hope you can sell some to australia or the us or whoever through these other trade deals but ultimately the eu remains your biggest nearest market virtually all countries developed countries trade mostly most with their neighbors so that's still got to be your you know the big area of your focus and same with services can we do something on professional qualifications can we you know you're going to have no shortage of ideas of things you need to do, to push to sell more into into the EU. But what can we do with the agreements to to support that? So that'll be the nature of it. Plus, doubtless, the other way around, the EU will be saying, well, we're a bit worried about the UK doing this, this and this. Mm. What can we do to stop them doing that? And, and vice versa. So it's, it's a constant. It'll be a constant uh, um, r um, rumble of um of, of updates, etc., to the agreement. And the UK will really need to step up our activities in Brussels and in member state mm. capitals because we've let that slide. I mean, it's very hard to remember that five years ago we were we were the basic leaders of about 10 member states called known as like-minded on uh, international mm. trade or regulation. We've kind of fallen out with most of those countries now. We really need to rebuild those relations. Mm. As is often said, Brexit is a process, not an event. I think that's quite clear. Um, David, in terms of um, trade around the world, on the front pages of the newspapers this week, we've seen uh, details of the various trade agreements struck by Liz Truss and her team at the Department of International Trade. Some 62 different trade agreements uh, with a claimed value of nearly £900 billion. Pounds. Um, but is there anything new about these agreements or are they really an emulation of, of what we, we've had before? No, there's nothing new about them. That's this. Mm. It was all, that's an amount that was already covered by trade trade agreements and is now covered by trade agreements that are either the same or slightly worse. Um, uh, in the case of the EU, substantially uh, more more barriers. Overall, um, the the UK will be putting up barriers to trade um, to the rest of the world in the uh, during during this government because the new barriers uh, being put up to EU to EU trade are so are so significant compared to the previous la absence of them that any marginal um, easing with regard to the rest of the world is is, is hardly going to uh, is, is hardly going to make up for it. Um, so the 900 billion that's just the value of trade with all of these countries um, is was already covered by trade deals in the case of 
um, about 700 billion. That is the EU, Turkey, Switzerland, a bit more than 720, I think. The EU, Turkey, Switzerland, Norway, the countries linked into the EU and possibly wider Europe as well. Um, and all of that is on worse terms than than before. Um, so no, it's uh, there's not there's nothing new there. It's not you can't get uh, good trade agreements with other countries, but they are going to be economically marginal at best. Some interests will do pretty well out of having those trade agreements, but um, I say it's about specific interests. It's not they're not going to be economic game changers. Hmm. We should talk about global Britain now and uh, trade outside of the EU, which is uh, you know it's been from the start like, the UK government's intention to pursue a broad and ambitious trading policy. Uh, what do you see uh, will be the, the factors or uh, the issues that will shape uh, UK trade outside of the EU and around the world in the coming years? Well, I think there's a couple of aspects to this. I mean, one is that in terms of real trade, um, nobody's going to take Global Britain seriously unless we have good relations in our own neighbourhood with the, with mm -hmm. the EU. That, that mm -hmm. seems to me straightforward. It doesn't mean you can't have Global Britain, but you've got to you've mm -hmm. got to pin it down in your in your local market. If you're not competitive in your local markets, you're not going to be competitive globally either. Mm -hmm. Now, there's an element of Global Britain which is working instead of working with the EU, working with some mid-range like-minded countries to try to keep the trade system going. That's not a bad plan. You've basically got a world trade system dominated by the big three: the EU, the US, China, who don't agree with each other on very much at all. Now, you've got then a bunch of other countries, of which the largest is Japan, and we'd be the next largest. Um, then the likes of Australia, South, South Korea, Mexico, perhaps, uh, New, New, New Zealand, Switzerland, who want to keep the trade system running, want a rules-based trade system. Now, that's our kind of natural home, it seems to me, now. So global Britain could mean working with those countries, not, be, not because you're going to change the world with those. You can't change the world, not with in the absence of big three. But to try to um, basically keep the big three at least vaguely honest to try to keep the system uh, going. That's going to be tricky for the UK because we're always going to run into the problem of um, whether we should do everything the US says or not. Um, so, you know, a US trade deal it looms over this quite large. Do we go for a US trade deal? Um, who, you know, they updated their, their models in 2008 and haven't changed since. So they're now very out of date as well. You know, do we try to do more trade with the rest of the world? We always try to do more trade with the rest of the world. We always try to, to export more. It's a mixed bag of, of success. No reason not to keep doing it. But then you need to be pretty sure of what what you do, where your, you know, where your economic strengths lie. And, you know, it's not clear how much more services, for example, we're going to be able to export uh, around the world, how easy that would be to grow. So, we, you know, we'll have to look at it pretty uh uh, pretty pretty harshly to see what more we can do. But previous initiatives to grow UK exports globally have run into a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. I can just want to ask one more question today before we conclude, which doesn't relate to the UK at all, but I suppose uh, we are implicated in some way or another. Um, and that is with regards to this supposed uh, investment deal between the EU and China. And it's, it's been in the, the news this week. It's an interesting story. And of course, there's concern uh, given potential uh, risks uh, with relations uh, regarding the, the US. Uh, how do you see this, this playing out, particularly with a Biden administration coming in uh, only in a, a few weeks' time? <laughs> the geopolitics and economics of it, US, EU and China are quite fascinating. I mean, the EU and the US, on the face of it, claim they have sufficient shared values that they want to, to, to take on China. But they also have, they have so many divides going back about 25 years over various subjects. The latest is digital taxes, but it could previously be food standards or Airbus Boeing. And actually, the commercial interests in the US and the EU are more interested in taking each other on than they are about having a joint front against China. Um, meanwhile, and China is able to exploit that. It's signed deals with both the EU and the US in the last in the last year. Trump signed a deal with China that was a previous deal with the EU on geographical indications. Now there might be an investment deal. So you know, essentially, unless the US and the EU can come to some kind of truce, and for the US in particular, this would be very difficult because it would mean the US would have to accept that the EU isn't just going to do what the US says, which has been kind of basically previous. Uh, uh, US policy of working with the allies has been to sort of tell them what to do. It can't do that with the EU. Um, and then, But unless it can, then it's not going to be able to have a common front over China. So that's, what, that's where it's sitting. I'm not confident at all that the EU and US can put aside their differences. 
because it would just ask too much of them. And I worked with the the EU and the US on over the uh, over the TTIP. And when it came to common values, they just weren't strong enough uh, no. to get to get over the long-standing grievances. So big ask to do to uh, to do that. But people are talking about it. So you never know. New admin new administration, fresh uh, fresh slate, but um, a lot of challenges. Mm. Just like the UK, a lot of challenges. An interesting place to finish. Uh, well, I'd like to thank um, everyone for watching this video live and also, of course, to thank yourself, David, for covering a lot of ground today. Um, it's going to be an interesting day, but thank you so much for your time. Thank you.